Welcome. My name is Christopher Merrill, and as the director of the International Writing Program, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this special event. Before we start a couple of housekeeping rules, please silence or turn off your cell phones. Uh, after uh, Mr. Janssen's address, he will take questions over here. You'll have to line up for that, okay? Um, and the reception, most important of all, will be afterwards uh, next door in the Blank Honors Center. And final announcement is to say this is, the, this is a part of the Creative Matters series, and we've just learned this afternoon that the sixth and final lecture of the fall will take place on either December 8th or 9th. Uh, Marilyn Robinson will be delivering a lecture called American Scholar Now. Tonight's lecture by the Dutch artist and engineer Theo Janssen, the fifth in a year-long series titled Creative Matters, is sponsored by the Office of the Vice President for Research. So I wish to begin by singling out for special thanks Dan Reed, whose support for the arts and humanities is crucial to the life of our community. Creative Matters, which brings together artists, writers, and thinkers to discuss the creative process, grows out of the Arts Advancement Committee, convened by Provost Barry Butler, Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, Chad and Jalali, co-chaired by Alan McVeigh and Chuck Swanson, our charge was to synthesize energies, forge connections across disciplines, spark new ideas in conjunction with the rebuilding of our arts campus. The flood of 2008, which wrecked such havoc, has inspired a building boom, which we hope to match in a variety of artistic and intellectual ways. Creative Matters is the brainchild of David Gere, George de la Pena, Anne Ricketts, and Leslie Weatherhead to whom I owe a great deal of thanks. This event would still be in the dreaming stage, absent their tireless effort. Creativity is a defining feature of the University of Iowa, the first higher educational institution in this country to award graduate credit for creative work. And to broaden our understanding of the mysterious means by which new discoveries are made in the arts, humanities, and sciences, we often turn to the creative process, reflections, invention, arts and sciences, a book of essays and reflections on the ways in which artists, writers, composers, mathematicians, and scientists have made discoveries that contributed so much to our fabric of life. In the introduction to this book, which has been in print continuously for over 60 years, the poet Booster Gieslin argues that, quote, Invention in the arts and in thought is a part of the invention of life. Creative matters foster such invention because it is critical to our aesthetic, physical, and spiritual survival. There is no more vital artistic inventor than Leo Janssen, who has been called the Leonardo da Vinci century. He began painting in the 1970s after abandoning a physics degree at the University of Delft, and it was not long before his restless imagination, interest in robotics and aeronautics led him to create a spaceship in the form of a flying saucer, which flew over his terror-stricken city. It was vastly unlike the missile that fired over most of the West Coast the other day. But it was with his sequence of genetic sculptures, strand beasts or beach beasts, that he achieved international acclaim, using basic materials like plastic tape, blends together his discoveries in engineering, biomedic mechanics, and art, create dream machines that seem to possess lives of their own, subject shaping forces of wind and sand. These machines walk across the dinosaurs, each seek sculptures marking an advance in their evolution. For Mr. Janssen, dreams of building creatures that will survive the lost world of the dinosaurs stored the ingenuity of a singular artist. Join me in welcoming Janssen to the University of Iowa. Thank you very much, Grace.
Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I cannot tell you how honored and grateful I am that I'm asked here to tell the story of my life, about my life, but also about the life I tried to create. So when I was about 17, I uh, had a dream, and that dream was to fly. So I, I wanted to become a pilot, but somehow, well, my eyes were not good enough. And I did some courses in flying, and I really enjoyed it, but my eyes were not good. I was losing my field, so I couldn't know where to land, so I had to take uh, landing in places where you were not supposed to land. <laughs> so they advised me not to do that. That was, of course, a disappointment. But if my eyes were, would have been good enough, I wouldn't be here. I would be flying around in airplanes. So then I decided to, uh, to f study physics in the town of Delft, which was uh, just 15 kilometers away from home. It's nothing comparing the distances here. But so I immigrated to Delft, which is uh, inland. I was born on the beach almost in Scheveningen. And I studied physics there for seven years. But I was not a very good student. And it was the hippie time, so I was distracted a bit <laughs> from my study. And uh, so I became a painter. So I never got my diploma of physics. And I became a painter. I painted for many years. I got a studio in Delft. Uh, and I'm still working there. So I studied about 35 years I'm working there. And then, indeed, like Chris told you, that. Uh, in 1980, there landed an idea in my head that I wanted to build a flying saucer, which could really fly. And the thing was black. It, was, it had a diameter of four meters. And it was just plastic filled with helium. But I launched it on a day that was a bit hazy. The weather was a bit hazy. And uh, because of the contrast with the sky, you couldn't see any depth in there. So people just saw a, a disk traveling through the sky. And you cannot estimate how high it is. <laughs> if you think it's very high, that many people thought, then it's very big. And it goes fast. And so that was on television. And I was famous for a few months in my country. <laughs> and after that, I was not able to paint anymore. Because I tasted more or less of attention, which was wider. So I think the motivation to stop painting was a little bit vulgar, <laughs> just asking for attention. And uh, so I started making machines. And that, that uh, resulted in a, a machine which could paint. So I didn't have to paint anymore. <laughs> It was a, a spray gun which is sensitive for light. So if there's light on it, then uh, it stops painting. But as soon as dark, it starts spraying paint. And it was mounted on a wall. And uh, the, the, the light cell was at the end of a tube. So when uh, traveling across the wall, it would react on all the light which is in front of the wall. So if uh, there's a, a person with a white shirt, when it would see the white shirt, it would uh, close the spray gun. So that would be white there as well. But if it, a black person comes by, it was black. So if the result is that when traveling along the wall, it would paint a photographic uh, painting from all the objects which were before the wall. So a few years. I lived on that machine. And then, uh, because I took it on my car, and I traveled it to festivals, and I demonstrated that. And then there came this, uh, I, in the meantime, I was a writer. And in 1990, I wrote a column about a sort of skeletons which would uh, walk on beaches 
And these, these skeletons, they would uh, gather sand to build up dunes. Uh, because uh, Al Gore told us that the, the, the sea level would rise and that in a few decades, Holland would disappear because of the, 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 the rising sea level. Now, the basic material for that skeletons, everybody knows this in Holland, it has the color of cheese. And we use it for power lines in houses. And especially uh, my uh, getting to know this, this kind of tube, it was about when I was 11 years old, I had a, a sort of hobby. All the Dutch people in the audience, there are some, know what I'm doing. Because all Dutch boys do this. So imagine there's an open window in the back. <laughs> I tried to do this safe. <laughs> well, sorry for you. <laughs> so, that's how it all started. And, uh, so this, this kind of nice tube, I, uh, it's very cheap. So you don't have to be rich to build big skeletons. And these skeletons, they turn out to walk. And while working with this kind of tube, I realized that I, uh, because I restrict myself to this material, I'm doing the same thing as the real creator. Because the real creator restricted himself also very much in the choice of his materials. He just used protein to build us. You can make skin with protein, eyes, everything you can make with protein. And you wouldn't say that if you put an egg in the pan to, uh, to fry it. Uh, this is a glancy material. You wouldn't say that that is the ultimate construction material for life. But still, if you have millions of years and you try again and again, and that's what protein does, it renews itself all the time. It tries again and again. Then the result is not bad, the way we're sitting here after all those billions of years. And I try to do the same. I restrict myself just to this kind of tube. And I try to make everything with this tube. And I discovered that the restriction, in fact, brings me further than I would buy all the stuff I need, which I come up with. So I will explain that later. First, I want to get in the, in the mood for Strand Beast by showing a video and to hear some Gustav Mahler music with it. So I hope you get in the right mood. <coughs>
Here the animal uh, drives a pin into the ground to anchor itself for the coming storm. So during the generations, the strap is... Oh, can we stop here? Thank you. So uh, during the generations, Every time I try to, uh, to find a new aspect of surviving on the beach. Because the big dangers, for instance, are the storms, the, the wind silences, the, the sand. The sand always creeps into the joints. And also the water, of course. And every time I try something new, a new method, you could see this as the evolution of methods that uh, these animals survive better and better these uh, circumstances. Now, I, I just use this kind of tube to, uh, as a sort of principle, you put, well, we couldn't call it a religion, it's going too far, but I, I don't want to buy everything. I just want to have just a bunch of tubes and then make the things. And that, the consequence of that is that when I have a plan and I go to my studio and I want to realize that plan, that that usually doesn't uh, succeed. Because the tubes, they protest. They don't want to do what I want to do. They always want something else. And the next day, I go to my studio again and then I have, again, I have a new idea, but that's based on the experiences of the day before with the, the tubes. And somehow these tubes, they push me in another way every time. And in fact, my, most of my plans don't succeed. It are all the plans of the, the tubes. And the road, the path, is very unpredictable because it's very capricious and you know no where to go. And in the end, you could say that I didn't make the animal, or I didn't design the animal, but it's done by the tubes. And uh, I'm surprised myself how beautiful the beasts are. I didn't work on beauty. It's done by the tubes. So people praise me for the beauty of the beasts, but in fact, I don't feel really responsible for that. It's done done by the tubes. I just did what the tube dictated me. 
Uh, I would like to tell you about the, the reproduction of the beasts. Well, my first ideas of reproduction was, of course, that I would feed tubes to the animals, and then they would work on it and make an animal, which could also make another animal. And I would certainly succeed in doing that, but it would take a few more million years. I have only <laughs> 20 years to do this. But it turned out that the strand bees, they were already reproducing, and they did it behind my back. And I will tell you how that happened. Before I can tell you that, I have to tell something about the anatomy. Anatomy? Yeah. Of the beasts. So the strand beasts, they have a sort of backbone, which makes a circular movement, like this. And this circular movement is transformed to a walking movement written by the pencil down there. And that's done by all these tubes in between. Now you see, as soon as the pencil is on the ground, it draws more or less a straight line. I hope you can see this in the back. It draws more or less a straight line. And that means that the animal, it stays on the same level. It doesn't toss up and down. Like we, when we walk, we always go up and down a little bit. But the, stress, the special way of strand bees walking is that they stay on the same level. And that's because of the shape of this curve because of the, the straight button there. Now, the shape of that curve is very much depending on the length of the tubes between the backbone and the pencil. If you have another proportion of length, then you get a totally different curve there. Now, when I started this, I didn't know which uh, proportion of length I needed to get this curve. That's why I wrote a computer program uh, which has this model in it. So when with a given proportion of lengths, you could uh, predict the, the, the shape of the curve. But still, there are so many possibilities that if I would let pass all the possibilities in the computer, it wasn't a, a very progressive computer. It was an Atari computer. <laughs> You're too young to know what that is. But, it's, uh, so the Atari computer, it's, um, it, if I look at past all the possibilities, it would be on for 100,000 years. So maybe with a good computer, you can bring it back to 100 years. But still, it's too long. That's why I needed to use the principle of uh, evolution in there. And uh, that worked in a way that were born 1,500 legs like this in the Atari, and they all had random lengths of tubes. So you get 1,500 different shapes of curves. The pencil draws all kinds of curves, 1,500 different ones. And none of them is this one. The chance is very small. But some of these 1,500 curves, they are lookalikes of this curve. They, look, they have a sort of resemblance. And those are selected by the computer, and they get the privilege to keep on living. The other ones, they die. And they get, apart from the privilege of living, they also get the privilege of multiplying. That means that the tubes are copied and reassembled to 1,500 new combinations in the computer still. And that you can see as the next generation, which is, has more resemblance with this curve. Now, this process of reproducing and selection, it went on for a few months, day and night, in the computer. And there came out 30 numbers out of the computer, which were the lengths of the tubes I needed to get this curve. And so in fact, the way the strand beasts are walking is based on a proportion of numbers. That's the big secret of the strand beast are 13 holy numbers. And you could see this as the DNA code of the strand beasts. Yeah. And I put this code on my website, on the internet. And since then, 
thousands of students in the whole world are using this code to make strand beasts. And uh, all these students, they have the ID that they're having a good time, that they have a nice hobby. But the fact is, they are used for the reproduction for the strand <laughs> So they're infected with this DNA code. <laughs> and so the strand bees, they use humanity to multiply. They, they see us just as a, as a heap of protein, which is useful for reproducing them. And this reproduction came to an acceleration when a few years ago, two students came to my studio, and they brought a box. Here's the box. This came out. There's a paper in there. Everybody can see it? And they said that this animal is uh, not assembled. It, it was born. They said it was born, and it turned out to be born, being born in a, in a 3D printer. And I, I knew about 3D printers, like well, we all do. But I didn't know you could make uh, moving objects in 3D printers. And it's, this was a very, uh, uh, very ingenious. 3D printer, it spreads out a thin layer of nylon powder, and then a laser melts some parts together. Then a next layer of nylon powder goes over it. Again, the laser, layer by layer, along takes hours, hours, hours. And then you end up with a box full of nylon powder, and this animal is in there. You just have to blow the powder off, and it runs over the table. Well, I was, how do you call this in American, flabbergasted? <laughs> because after, I hope you realize what kind of epoch we are born, that after four and a half billion years of reproduction in DNA and protein, we are now reproducing with DNA codes of zeros and ones and using nylon powder. Because these zeros and ones you can put on the internet, and you can print out an animal at all sides of the world. And that's what's happening at the moment. And what you see here is, in fact, it's a mutant. It's made by somebody in Amsterdam called Ad Lagerfeld. And he made his own DNA code. And I must say, it walks quite nice. <laughs> Maybe his code is better than my code. <laughs> and that means it will have more descendants on the internet. What I want to say is that there's an evolution going on on the internet of strand beasts, which is totally out of control. <laughs> it's happening without me. And I, I couldn't stop it if I would want it. It's just happening. And that's what I call life. It's, so the strand beasts are really reproducing, not maybe as a gene, but as a meme, it, uh, especially on YouTube. People have, have seen that, and they want to reproduce it. Somehow, it, it turns on people to make strand beasts of wood, of aluminum. And you have so many kinds now. You have the Zack Way. You're standing on there. And there are bicycles. There are wheelchairs. There is a, a very funny one which I just have seen because there's now an exhibition going on in Salem, in, uh, not too far away from here, in Salem in Massachusetts, near Boston. And there, they had all these, these, uh, these hackers, they call them. And uh, it was a small ball with a, a hamster running in there. And it was mounted on a very small strand beach. So, wow, <laughs> the, the hamster was running. It was walking. That was a good idea. So there, 
they are all mutants, and they all have uh, descendants. And uh, I think the animal will become better and better just because of this evolution. So now I would like to tell you something about the, the nervous system of the beast. Uh, Chris, could you help me and hold this so that everybody can see it? Yeah, wonderful. Because I need all my hands to do this. Hey. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you very much. Well done. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's a small O-ring at the end here. And it fits exactly in another tube. So these uh, pumps, you could say, they are uh, connected with the wing. So you have seen in the movie, you have seen the wings going up and down in the wind. And these are connected. So it pumps air. And it's just like a bicycle pump. And it pumps air into soda bottles, which are on the back of the bees. So they press the wind, you could say, into the bottles to high pressure. And they, the strandies can use this energy when the wind is gone. They can walk on that energy because if you connect a bottle with a pump like this, this jumps out. In fact, what you created here is a muscle. A muscle is nothing but an object which becomes longer or shorter on command. And the command is given by a valve which opens here. If the valve opens, this jumps out. And the valve, you could see, as a nerve cell. I have a nerve cell here. This is a nerve cell. And I would like to demonstrate this. So if I blow air in here, The air goes in here and comes out of here. But if I push in this piston here, it's blocked. So this is a valve. Open, close. This, so this is, you could see this as a nerve cell. Which, if it opens, then the muscle is stretched. If it closes, it comes back. Well, usually I have an elastic uh, attached to it, which pulls it back. Now, these nerve cells you can regulate by a sort of also muscle like this. I hope you all can see it. It's quite, can you see it in the back? So if I blow air in here, the, the valve closes and no air comes out of here. So if you see this as the input, and this is the output, then the output is opposite from the input. Everybody says, OK, <laughs> there's output and input. I know what that is. But I, will say, I want to make it very clear to you. If you see this as a person, this is a person, and this is the mouth, and this is the ear, the mouth says the opposite from what it hears. <laughs> so if it hears there's air, the mouse says, no, there's no air. And that's why I call this a liar. It says the opposite from what it hears. <laughs> now imagine, we're going to do an experiment now. Uh, let me see. Imagine that you are a liar. And you are a liar. And I'm a liar. So. I say yes to you. You say here, yeah, yes, you're a liar. What would you say to her? It's, it's not easy for you to lie, I guess. Well, as a good liar, you should hear yes, and you say no to her. You hear no, what you say to me? And I hear yes, and I say no. So in this conversation of three liars, I changed my opinion. And that's what you have with an uneven number of liars. You keep changing your opinion, and you have a so-called dynamic system. <laughs> with two liars, you have a static system. You keep saying the same thing. But with three liars, 
you have a, a dynamic system. And I have three layers here. <laughs> So this is you, <laughs> and this is you, and this is me. And let's see what the liars have to tell to each other. <laughs> so they're saying yes and no, like we did. And as you know, you can see a yes as a one and a no as a zero. In fact, what you can do this, with these liars is to switch zeros and ones, just like in a computer. And in fact, what you see here is the beginning of the brain of the strand beasts. So they can take their decisions. So I have this dream that these animals are migration animals. So let's say that there's a beast standing in Kijk daar, this is a little village along the coast I was born. And the wind is southwest. It walks over the hard part of the beach along the coast, which is because the wind is parallel to the coast. And it goes to Scheveningen. It's another town. It goes with its ski, ski poles, which are driven by pneumatics in these bottles on the soft sand. And it waits until the wind has turned 180 degrees. It might take a few weeks, but these animals are incredibly patient. They don't care about time. They just wait until the wind is northeast. Then they go with the ski poles to the hard sand again, catch up the wind, and walk back to Kijkduin. So I see them as migration animals. And I want them to do this one day on their own. So they have to take the, their own decision to know when the wind is southwest, they have to go to Scheveningen. They have step counters. So a step counter is nothing but a, a pump which is connected to the legs, which pumps by every step. It pumps a little bit air into a bottle. So the pressure will increase while walking. And once the pressure exceeds a certain level, it knows it has arrived in Scheveningen. So it goes with a ski six on the, the soft sand and waits again. That's the idea. Of course, they need sensors. And they need to feel the wind, how strong the wind is, the direction of the wind. They also feel the hardness of the sand. This is a, a sand feeler. Well, it used to be a sand feeler. So there are two pins here. As soon as it's uh, it beats on um, soft sand, then nothing will happen. But on hard sand, this is pushed up. And then they know they are closer to the sea. So that's how they navigate. You must imagine that these animals, they are blind and they are deaf. And they don't know where they are on the beach. They can't even hear the sea. So they don't know which direction that is. So this is how they can more or less find out. And based on the outer information, the brains have to take the decision to uh, what to do, to decide to go uh, to the, the hard sand or not, to wait. All those kind of things they have to decide on their own. And so they also need uh, a water feeler. This is the water feeler. Now, this tube, this hose, it goes over the ground about this height. And it sucks in air all the time. So, and then it arises to the sea. And it swallows the water and feels the resistance of the water. And then something has to happen. Otherwise, the animal is going to drown. So they have to, a nerve cell has to switch over. And then they have to use their ski poles to run as fast as they can out of the sea again. Now, we're going to try the water feeler right now here. We need a very brave person. And I know a very brave person. He is sitting over there. Op is a brave person, right? 
Up, would you come and help me? Yes. Can you hold this? I, yeah, I think I can. Okay. And so what I'm going to do is I have a bottle of water somewhere. It's here, yeah. So this is the sea, and I'm going to put the hose into the water, and you should happen something there. And I think I'm going to put the, the liars on it. So as soon as it, the, the hose goes in here, you should hear the liars rattling, uh, saying yes and no. Are you OK? Yeah, yeah, so far. So far, so good. <laughs> uh, where are the liars? There. I said yes, I'm a <laughs> <laughs> So we kind of connected somewhere here. So let me see. Those are the liars. Yeah. Those are the liars, and I have to do. Yes, OK. Now up. I don't want you to get hurt. <laughs> All right. You are brave enough. And uh, so I'm going to open the valve now, and it starts moving in your hand. OK. So, uh, and, and then I'll look for my, the C here. So all, all ready, all set now? OK, here we go. Oh, it's already feeling water. It shouldn't. So now it comes to the sea. Here it comes. And it fell the water. We tried to do this again. Yes. Okay, up. Fantastic. Well done. <laughs> so, usually I start building a beast in October. So I just started. And then I bring it to the beach in spring. During the summer, I do all kinds of experiments with either the sand or the, the storms. And then comes the fall, and I declare the animal extinct. <laughs> it, it's that. And I don't want to work with it, on it anymore. And uh, since a few years, what, and these animals go to, when, used to go to a boneyard. But since a few years, these animals are adopted in exhibitions. So these exhibitions, they're, it's, they're all fossils of animals. And you can see the, the evolutionary development on the fossils. And we can reanimate uh, these fossils by pumping them up with a compressor. We pump up air into the, the soda bottles. And then the animal walks into the museum. And uh, I'm so happy that we are having a tour now going on in the United States. So it started in, in Salem until January. Then it goes to Chicago. That's, Chicago is closer, right? Yeah. The Cultural Center in Chicago. Ever heard of that? And, uh, so, and then it goes to San Francisco. That's a little bit further again. So, and, uh, and these exhibitions, they travel in the world. So these, these animals, they travel in shipping containers to this exhibition. So I'm working now on number 38 in the animal. And it's, uh, it has a sort of trunk, just like a, an elephant. And i trying to, to do a new prevention of blowing away. Instead of the hammer, they just uh, put sand with the trunk on a, a sort of plate to make it very heavy. And hopefully next summer, they will survive the storms better, because the storms are always the big enemy of the beasts. So I don't know how far I am. Is it time for questions already? 
Yes? Questions? Okay. So it seems like you're in your design the joint, that first joint that's mobile using the existing materials was is that what a bottleneck originally in doing this? The, and the joints, the, the bottle? joint. I mean, was there a bottleneck? I mean, is that was that one of the first things you had to overcome is figure out how to make the joints work with the PVC tubing? Yes. Well, I, uh, I so you have different sizes of this uh, tubing. When you have right angles and everything. Yeah. Well, you have right angles, but I don't use that. I, I heat it. And uh, uh, I don't have joints here, right? No. So I, I make a sort of heated a hang, a, a sort of hook at the end. And then I put a ring also made of this kind of tube. And then it, it just can go over another tube. Now, in the beginning, always the sand was a big problem because the sand creeps into the joints. And uh, so the shape was in a way that it would work the sand a little bit to the side in the beginning. And since a few years, they have a sort of sweat system that there are little sweat glands, uh, so little holes, in fact, in the tube. And before they start walking, they first sweat out the sand. So they wash out the sand of the joints. And I put a little bit of soap in there just to lubricate it a little bit more. And in the future, of course, when they have to live alone, they have to just use rainwater to do this, and so they work a lot better with the sweat system, you could say. You have a question? Yes. <clears throat> uh, can you talk about the, the wings, the sails a little bit, what materials you yes. used? And I, I noticed that um, in the picture slideshow at the beginning, there was one that, or in the video, there was one that opened itself up and closed itself up, yeah. the wings. Can you yeah. talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So the, the sails, in the beginning, I made them all of sellotape. So I just, with sellotape, you could make this, a, a rope in there. And then, uh, but it, it was a lot of work. And then I noticed that you could just use these Dacron sails, which are used for uh, kites and for uh, sail, sailboats as well, spinnakers. And uh, there was somebody who could make it for me with tunnels in there. And the, uh, the way, uh, they are quite resistant for weather circumstances. So they, they, they start white, and then in the, in the years they become a little bit well, more natural, I would say, a little bit gray. And they, they have a sort of, uh, you call it reefing the sails when it's very storming on a, on, a, on a boat that you reef the sails, make it smaller. Now, there are pumps which are connected with the end of the sail. And they pulled in. And as soon as so the, the sails are pulled in, and then if you put air in there, all the pumps stretch. And then you see the sails coming out. And then they catch the wind. And then they start waving. So it's all based, in fact, on pneumatics. And with this kind of tube, you can also make very long pumps of four meters long. And it jumps out another four meters, so you get something which starts with four meters length and then is eight meters. So you can also make a sort of tongue which goes over the ground and can feel the water um, more in the sea as well. Okay. Was this, yeah, this was an answer to your question. Yes. Hello. Hi. Oh. I was wondering, um, so you have built or worked on machines that react to natural elements like wind and thick sand and water. Have you thought about making beasts that react to other creatures like humans, like urban beasts or cosmopolitan beasts? <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, if I uh, had two more lives, I would <laughs> love to do that, to have desert beasts and, and all this kind of beasts. But it's, I only have, hopefully, 20 years to go. And so I restrict myself to the beach where I was born. So apart from life uh, in general, it's also about my private life, that it was 
the first acquaintance with life was on that beach. And so that's also the beach where I want to end. And so the beach, the beast have to live on that particular beach. Now you said something. Uh, that was not your question, was it? <laughs> or was it? Well, anyway, it comes up later maybe. I was thinking of something very interesting, by the way, but. <laughs> um, in the video, you met, uh, there was a, an image of you pulling one of them. Yes. It, and it didn't look like it was made out of the pipe, so I was just wondering what was the, the story behind that one, because it was massive. Like, it was much bigger oh, than those Oh, yes, ones. that one, yes. Yeah. So, yes, the, I usually I work with the tubes, and, so, and I have been quite faithful to the tubes for uh, many years, but there was one year <laughs> that I uh, wanted to make a very big animal, and it turned out that steel is a good material for that. So this was an animal of uh, almost five meters high, and you could sit in there, and it was covered with polyester. It was, had a polyester skin, and it was more than three tons, 3.2 tons, and it walked quite well on the wind. Uh, we tried it on a runway of an airport, and in fact, it ran too fast on the wind. It broke itself. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's now in Amsterdam. It's standing uh, in the street, uh, and I had this dream that these animals would uh, walk on the dam in Amsterdam. So you, just like the bulls in Pamplona, it would, the bulls are out <laughs> in the streets and the beasts would be out in Amsterdam. That, but until now, I didn't succeed doing that. Maybe later. Hello? Yeah. Why did you start making strand beasts? Why? That's a very good question, because I, I don't know why <laughs> I did it. It's something, well, why it suggests that there's a reason you do something. And in fact, there is no reason. Life doesn't have a reason. We, are, we have no reason to be here. But I must admit, it's, it's fun, it's nice, it's, <laughs> and I, I see it as a, as a big miracle that we exist. It's uh, especially when I'm on the beach, under the clouds, and I see it as a, a wonderful miracle that we are here. Especially, I'm so surprised that I'm here, because <laughs> I suppose that you all experience is that the fact that we are here is such a special thing. And, but it doesn't have any reason. It's not good for anything. It's apart from just being part of it. And it's uh, maybe, I, looking backwards, I could say that I try to make new forms of life to, uh, to become wiser about the existing forms of life. And so I have at least the illusion that I became wiser. And I wrote stories about that in a, in a book, thick book, called The Great Pretender. That's me. And uh, so I, I think I became wiser. So I, this was a, quite a negative answer, right? But I didn't, to make it more positive, I became wiser. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you were talking about how some of the beasts know how um, to sense the weather and when it's going to storm to, you know, yeah. post themselves down. I was wondering if there's a mechanism like the cells that help you realize that the weather's coming? Or Well, I'm, I was thinking of a barometer because you can make a barometer with this, uh, these bottles so they can measure the pressure with a, a line with water in there. So if the, the pressure would be low, then the water would raise in the, in, the, in the tube. And then with a water feeler, you could feel the water, which is rising. So they could warn for a low pressure and uh, warn for a storm. So they can take their precautions. This is wonderful. Um, 
because you walk your beasts by the ocean. Yes. Um, the, and the ocean can blow lots of driftwood and things up onto the beach. You have two choices. You either clean the beach or you make your beast smarter so it can step over, over things. Yeah. So are you thinking of trying to get things to step over? So you'd have to come up with different mechanisms. Yes. Well, of course, you have, apart from driftwoods, you have other objects like holes in the and little lakes. It sometimes they have this, this trouble to, 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 to walk over that, but that's why they have the ski poles. So they have pumps, which are on the hip, front hip, and they all stretch together. Uh, there are seven of those, and they just can uh, jump over, more or less. Also, they can walk on the very fluffy sand, and uh, so they, uh, they have the ski poles to overcome that. Of course, it would be nicer if they would clean the beach, right? <laughs> but I, well, I will be working on that. Um, I know you said you started painting, and once you got a taste for this, you moved on, of course. Do you still paint? No, I don't paint. <laughs> I'm sorry to say it, because I love painting. And, and indeed, if I had... Uh, yeah, indeed, more lives. I would be a painter. So I, I would like to be a poet as well. And there are so many things you want to do, is, but you have to make your choices. And I love painting still, but I have no time. <laughs> do you think you'll ever try a swimming beast? Yes, that's a good idea. Because uh, there were swimming beasts. It was sort of the worm family. I didn't show it yet, but uh, they uh, had bottles uh, under it, so it was a worm which could move like a worm, and it could persist in its movement and sort of uh, swim there. But they didn't walk very well on, on sand. And uh, so you have either animals which are afraid of water or animals who love the water. And these were water-loving animals but they hated the sand. And uh, so they, that part of evolution branch, it just stopped. Maybe it's come up again. So the, in the, also in the museum in Salem, you can see the, the family tree of the evolution. So, and you see a branch there, the worms, and it just stopped. Uh, what's your relationship to these beasts? Are they like friends or children or something else entirely? Mm -hmm. Well, you would think that, of course, that uh, after you're working with this lovely material and this lovely beast, uh, that you get a sort of friendship. But the answer is no. <laughs> I see them as, as mechanisms. And I love the mechanism, but it's a totally different kind of feeling which I have with my co-specimen, with my family. Um, it's, it's, it's much, I don't recognize a person in this mechanism. Of course, I, I, I love those beasts, and I see them as my mental children. So you have your, your physical children from below, and these are my mental children <laughs> from above. <laughs> And, it's, uh, and there comes a day that you, you put your, your, your physical children on the streets and you say you have to do it on your own. And that's what's going to happen with the mental children as well. But I don't care if, I would care a lot more if my own children would have problems than these animals. Um, what is the most frustrating part during the whole creation? How did you overcome it? Yes. Well, you notice maybe that there is a lot of failure in the beast. It's a, a lot of disappointments you have to uh, encounter with. But it seems if you have so many disappointments that you don't care after a while, that it doesn't, uh, doesn't work. Uh, in fact, uh, I was, uh, a, a few months ago, I was in Nagasaki where I saw the first animal, which I made 25 years ago. And it could only move its legs laying 
on its back. It couldn't even stand on its feet. It had a very complicated leg system, and it, uh, it looks quite pathetic. I must say. <laughs> and, but when I was working at, at it 25 years ago, I didn't see that. I, I just saw what it was going. In fact, I saw the whole thing in front of me. And so I didn't care if, if I had a reason to believe in it. it. I just was optimistic without reason. And that's something which is a, 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 a form of naivety, maybe. But it, it, it brought me somewhere just to keep on believing even if there is no reason to believe in it. And that, what I, I think this is my, I have it from my mother to be uh, optimistic always. So I remember that bad messages of, uh, they came to our house and then she always turned it in a way that it was a positive message. And that's uh, fooling yourself a little bit, but it's, it brings you further than uh, being pessimistic, I think. Yes. Hi, uh, thank you so much for coming. This is really interesting. Um, I have a question about the legs themselves. Yes. Um, you're basically using linear elements to approximate the motion of a wheel, which yes. nature has never really evolved. Yes. And there are different ways to put that linkage together. You can do it with six elements or 12 elements or mm -hmm. uh, more or less. And so I was wondering if that was part of your original program or if you just uh, manipulated the lengths and why you settled on the number of uh, linkages that you used. Yes. Well, the, I just manipulated the length, you could say. But in fact, this is a, a new wheel. Because a wheel stays on the same level as well. And so this is, has the, the same quality as a wheel. The only thing is you have legs which leap over. If you have a, a wheel on the beach, it has to touch every point of the path. So you have, it has to deform the sand on all the, all the points of the path. And legs, they just jump over. And they leap over pieces of the path. So that has less resistance than a wheel on soft sands. So that's why the leg system is better than the wheels. And of course, yeah, indeed, the wheels are not invented by evolution. And there are many theories about that. And it, of course, a wheel is a wonderful invention of us. And it, it works still quite well after 5,000 years. Uh, but after 5,000 years, also, we have a new wheel. And that's the, the lag system. Still more questions. Oh, oh, it's so funny. Oh, Scheveningen is one of my favorite beaches. Oh, really? I, yeah. And I love this presentation. But I'm very curious how long some of these live alone on the beach. And how, has any one of them ever wandered off and sort of had a mind of its own? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I'm talking about this beast as if it's, they're almost ready to go. But they cannot do without me for five minutes. <laughs> so I, I have to nurse them all the time still. But I hope to, uh, to stretch that period that they, uh, and they're getting better and better. Because in the beginning, they couldn't do without me at all. And uh, what was your second question? Has anyone wandered off? Oh, yeah. Well, I had sometimes that. That's what you have sometimes on Dutch beaches. You have a totally wind silence. And then there comes a five-minute storm. And so I, I had a herd on the beach. And then the five-minute storm, the whole herd was rolling on the beach. <laughs> Just a mile down there. And then. I had to pick them all up. But of course, it's PVC. I should be careful with pollution. So when they're in the sea, I have to run into the sea to get them out. And so I have to save them always, yeah. <laughs> but mark my words, there comes a day before I die that these animals are going to live. We have a few more questions, yes? Um, you talked about like the life cycle where you, you know, build them over the winter, and then they walk in the spring and summer, and then they, they're off to the boneyard. Has the whole 25 years been just kind of linear and incremental, or has it been occasional like flash, and then you made like a great leap forward in yes. improvements? 
Yes, it's 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 not going. Uh, it's not easy going. No, so it's it's going in, in really big jumps, and for a long time nothing happens. Sometimes I use old animals to take all the legs off and use it for a new animal. So it's not very consequent uh, that this this cycle of every year, because otherwise I couldn't work on the 38th animal because then it would have been 38 years. So sometimes I do a little bit more smaller animals, bigger animals. So about the last few years, it's about every year, uh, any, every year one animal. The last two. Um, I find it very interesting how you talk about these as animals and you refer to them continually as if they're, they're alive. And I wonder if you could um, just explain a little bit more about your philosophy on the definition of life and this kind of evolution towards zeros and ones and, uh, and reproduction through us that you've yes. been talking about. Yes. Well, of course, this, uh, what helped very much in the reproduction of the strand bees was the, the coming of the internet, uh, especially the, com the, the coming of YouTube. And that's because you don't need very much time to see what's happening when you see an animal walking on YouTube. And we seem to be very sensitive for this movement of animals. Because in evolution, an animal could mean something to run away for or something to eat. So our retina is very sensitive for that kind of movement. And when you see it on YouTube, you see an animal walking, but you also see just a bunch of tubes. And that somehow turns a switch in our brain. And that's happening to almost everybody. When they see 10 seconds of strand beast walking, they have this switch turning over. And that's why the, the meme of strand beasts, I hope you know the, 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 the term meme, means something like a gene, but something, a, a gene which jumps from one brain to another brain. So it's multiplying through brains. And this meme of the strand beast, they're multiplying so well because of the internet. And so they, the meme goes from brain to brain. And uh, so you tell it to your neighbor, and, and they look at the internet. And so that's how the strand beast Hopefully, they will stay for a while in the brains of you. Maybe there comes a moment that we all have forgotten about the strand beast. But my hope is, in fact, that when these animals are walking on the beach and I leave the planet, that some students take over and they continue my work. So there are a lot of students here, and I hope <laughs> that this is going to, this meme is really getting roots in their brain, yes. I notice that some of your uh, constructions are very large and very complex. Do you work alone or do you have a team that helps you with construction or even the design? Mm -hmm. Well, I, uh, I usually work alone, and, uh, but uh, sometimes I need help of people uh, on the beach because these very big animals, they, I cannot handle on my own anymore. Uh, so I need people. Nowadays, I build something behind my car so I can uh, bring it back when it has been walking away. And there's uh, a person who is, when I'm working on the beach, there's a person in my winter working place, and he makes parts. So I have help of uh, people who, uh, who produce just uh, the regular parts which come back all the time. And so making the walking units, which don't change that, uh, that much anymore. So there are uh, some parts at the end of the evolution. And so they reproduce those parts. Is somebody sitting there still? Or is it? OK, so we are at the end. Well, thank you, for ladies and gentlemen, for listening. <laughs> and I really take a few days. By way of closing, I would say that some of the words that kept coming up, barometer, evolution, 
DNA, miracle, life, wisdom, fun, switching the turn, switching the, switch the turn on. You've given us a thoroughly delightful and instructive afternoon, and you've turned on all these switches in our minds. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much fun to do this.